Heavenly Father, we bless your name for your goodness. We thank you because of the way you're speaking to us in this retreat. Thank you for gathering us together for the power for the present hour. And we're praying, O oh Lord, the part to face the future. And the part to understand when we come to a crossroad. The part to be able to make the right choice in our lives. And the part to walk in the path that leads to victory. Grant to every one of us in Jesus' name. You must have had something in mind when you called us by the gospel and you brought us into the kingdom at such a time like this. We're praying, Lord, that your purpose of bringing us into the kingdom at such a time like this for our personal benefit and for the benefit of our families and for the salvation of our community and the world, we pray nothing will hinder your purpose for our lives in jesus name we're asking the lord that where we have been walking around without taking heed to ourselves and to our ways and then a path has become confused lord we pray you straighten out everything in every one of our lives in jesus name once again, Lord, we're pleading that as we read your word, impress the right thing upon every heart, O Lord, in Jesus' name. Help us, Lord, to remain in your very presence and in your power. And everything you want to accomplish in us and for us and through us, do it, O Lord, in Jesus' name. We give the glory to you as we know you are going to edify everyone in your church. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Thank you very much. We can sit down. We come to consider something in the word of God that many people do not generally look at. You need to remember that the church, I mean the large church, the church all over the world, they're divided into two major sections. There is the part of the church that think that whatever will be, will be. God has predestined everything. And God has ordained everything. And you cannot avoid, you cannot have a kind of prevent anything happening. That whatever happens in life to you, to your family, or to the church, or to the community, or to the nation, it is something unchangeable unavoidable cannot be prevented that's one part of the church another part of the church believes that there are things avoidable there are things preventable we don't have to go through all the calamities of the world we don't have to suffer unnecessarily there are things that are before us or things around us that we do not need to allow to destroy our present lives or our future lives. The first part of the church, believing that whatever will be, will be. They do not look at the responsibility of man. They do not look at what the Lord has told us, that this is the way, walk ye therein, that I put life and death before you and therefore choose life that you may live you and your sons they do not know that we have the power and the freedom the volition of choice therefore they just say God has ordained everything he has predestined everything and in their understanding of predestination anything that happens those things were made to happen but we're coming to this message today and we're looking at divine antidote for preventable tragedy you find a lot of words there one tragedy that means something negative terrible might be death destruction perdition punishment calamity suffering sickness attack affliction whatever tragedy 
there's another word there, preventable. That means that those tragedies don't have to take place. And those difficulties, they don't have to come. And the things people plunge themselves into, they don't have to happen. They are preventable. They are avoidable. And then he tells us there is an antidote. If there's a tragedy, we should have prevented. And we did not prevent a tragedy. If there is a danger, a difficulty, devastation, destruction that people have gotten themselves into, they should have avoided it, but they did not. There is still an antidote, a solution, a way out. Then the word is divine. That means the divine provision, what God himself has said. That if you look at your life from the beginning to this time, and you've seen tragedy, which you could have prevented, avoided, but you did not prevent. There is an antidote that God himself, that heaven is providing for us. And when you take that antidote, you will prevent the unnecessary dangers that we have in our lives. Let me just clear it up for you. Because of the many people that do not understand, there is preventable tragedy. And they say what will be, will be. Take the case of Aaron and the golden cow. Moses went to the top of the mountain to receive the law from the hand of the Lord. And then he handed over to his assistant, his name Aaron. Keep the people, stay with the people. The Lord is taking them to the land of Canaan. And I'm going to get the law from the hand of the Lord that will direct the people and move them along in the right way. While he was gone, the people came to Aaron and he said, Up, oh, make us gods, make us idols that will go before us. Don't tell me that God predestined them to make idols. He commanded them not to make idols. Don't tell me that whatever will be, will be. They couldn't avoid, of course, they could avoid it. But he didn't avoid it. And God said, Moses, go down to your people. I reject them. They're no more my people. I'm going to make you a great nation. I will destroy them. That destruction was preventable. Just don't make the idol. We find the case of Nadab and Abihu. The two sons of Aaron. And God said, Aaron, you know what? I'm going to make your sons the priests, and you will be the high priest. I'm giving you this special privilege. You will offer sacrifices unto me for the sake of the children of Israel. And this is the kind of incense and fire sacrifice an adoration, that oblation that will give to the Lord and Nadab and Abihu they made strange fire and they came to the presence of God, fire came from heaven, burnt them up that tragedy of the fire coming burning them up, it was preventable they caused it for themselves and Ananias and Sapphira in the early church people were coming they were selling what they had and they were offering to the lord and it was voluntary there wasn't anything compelling everybody that you must sell everything you have even if you sold if you bring half tell us it is half it will bring one quarter tell us this is one quarter if you are bringing a tenth, a tithe, tell us it is a tenth. but then Ananias came and he gave each, and the apostles said, Is this all? Who said, This is all? How is it that you have lied unto the Holy Ghost? Whilst it remained, it was yours, it was in your hand, and you could do as you pleased with it. And he fell down dead. That's the tragedy that was avoidable, preventable. And then three hours later, the wife came and Peter said, tell me, what your husband brought, was that all? That's all. How is he to agree together? And she died right there. A couple dying prematurely 
and going to hell preventable it shouldn't have happened and because it was in their hand you're thinking about the ten spies out of the twelve go search the land bring us back word and tell us how the land is don't make any conclusion don't tell us we can or we cannot that's not in your hand that is the hand of leadership but you go see the land the walls the people who are there bring us back word if you can bring some fruit so we'll know the land is fruitful and he came back and he said we went to the land and we saw the people and then the sons of the Anakim sat there and the fruit this is the fruit full stop that's enough that's all we told you to find out you have given us enough information don't say more then he continued but the giants are there and we as big as we are we were like grasshoppers in their side and then they continue they said we cannot go in you don't have to say that we cannot go in we were by the red sea who said we cannot go in we went through the red sea don't tell us any conclusion just tell us what you have seen leave the conclusion to the man of faith and to the moses that was leading but they said we cannot the whole land they began to cry and he said, we're going to choose a captain. And he's going to lead us back to Egypt. And God said, I'm going to make them wander in the wilderness for 40 years. That tragedy of wandering for 40 years was a preventable tragedy. Balaam, he died unnecessarily. How many people die unnecessarily? And these people came from Balak. And he said, Balak. The king of Moab is calling you. He wants you to come and curse the people. He said, stay there tonight. I want to go and ask the Lord. While he was asking the Lord, before he even opened his mouth, God said, who are those people? Oh, they came from Balak. What have they come to do? They want me to come and curse the children of Israel. He said, don't go. That's all. The tragedy that happened to Balaam later is preventable because the Lord had said, don't go. And he came to the people the Lord refuses me to go. I cannot go. And then Balak sent back to him again. Why won't you come? You're missing something. I'm going to promote you. I'll give you money. Name it. And I'll give you whatever you want. Then he went to God again and he said, can I go? And the Lord said, you want to go? Go. And then he went. And while he was going, an angel came with his son drawn. And the ass saw the angel. And he has turned this way and that way. Eventually his eyes were opened. And he said, I'm sorry, angel. I didn't see you. I would have killed you. Why it not for that ass? Your way is perverse before the Lord. Ah, okay. If you don't want me to go, I will not go. Still saying he. And the angels, okay, you can go. And eventually he got there. God opened his eyes. He began to prophesy. And Balak said, go. You don't, you don't want the money. And then he went around. He said, you know what? How to get the people? Make them commit adultery and fornication. Immorality with your people. God will forsake them. And eventually a war arose. He died in that battle. A false prophet. The death of Balaam was preventable. He shouldn't have died like that. Think about the man Jonah. I've appointed you a prophet. Arise and go to Nineveh that big city and you tell them my word that their sins have come unto me therefore they're going to perish because of their sin and then Jonah he knew the way to Nineveh he went the other direction and then he got into the ship and then a storm arose all that storm is a tragedy that they could have avoided and then all the mariners took all their own property and they were throwing them into the sea. The loss of their property. It was an avoidable, a preventable tragedy. It shouldn't have happened. And eventually they said, 
who are you? Where are you coming from? Why is all this befalling us? And he said, I'm a prophet of God. I have an anointing, a calling of God upon my life. And I am the cause of all this. They rode, they tried, they did everything. And the storm was increasing. And he said, what are we going to do? Throw me into the sea. They threw him into the sea. And then a whale swallowed him up. Then he began to cry, began to lament, and began to tell the Lord, Oh Lord, this has come upon me. Jonah, we are saying this is preventable all the things that happen to jonah why is it that human beings they will just go on like that and god is saying this is the way out and yet they have this tragedy esau lost his birthright and again it's a preventable thing he came back from the field and he said I'm hungry. Hey, you are a hunter. You are not a baby. And some of the people that fast for three days, can't you fast for one day? There are even some people that have fasted for seven days, can't you fast for one day? There are people that do without food and water for even 14 days, can't you do without food for just one day? Then, then he saw the pottage that Jacob had prepared and he said can you give me the portage on one condition you know the birthright and the privilege of the firstborn that you have got that is what i want send it to me i'll give you all the portage you need and then he sold his birthright and when it was time to get the blessing even though he sought it carefully with tears he couldn't get it that was a tragedy that happened to Esau but it was preventable i'm showing you that all over the bible the people that got into all this kind of strategy and they could have prevented it lord's wife angels came from heaven and then they held their lines when they were lingering and said come out of this place because we're going to destroy the place and then they said go to the mountain top don't stay in the valley and don't look behind you and while they were going, Lord's wife looked back behind her and became a pillar of salt. It was a preventable tragedy. What I'm telling you is, as you look at your life, many things that have happened in your life. This is negative. You fell into a pit here. And that's negative fell into another valley there. That is negative destruction, devastation happening to you or your family. Things that could have been prevented. Preventable tragedy. Do you remember Gehazi? Naaman had come from Syria. Came to the man of God with his leprosy. And the man of God said, go wash in River Jordan. And you're going to be made whole. You know the argument. Why should I do it? Why should I do it? I'm not a banner and farpa. Better rivers. But then eventually they persuaded him. He went in there seven times and he was cleansed. And then he came back and gave the man of God all the money he wanted to give. And the man of God said, no, I don't need your money. Freely have you received and freely give. And then he was going. And Gaza said, what? My master will allow this man to go like that. And then he ran after him. Now Gehazi should have understood the kind of man and the kind of prophet Elisha was. And that these were the man that will see the secrets of the lives of people. And he should have known that Elisha will know. But then he came back and Elisha said, Yes, I. Where have you been? Oh, that time you could have just prostrated immediately. I'm sorry. I've gone somewhere. I did something. And he could have repented at that time. But he said, the servant went nowhere. And then Elisha said, didn't my eyes, my mind, my heart go with you? When you went after the man, is this the time to take clothes and riches and money and all that? And the leprosy of Naaman come upon you preventable tragedy here is Uzziah he was a king and the Lord had helped him until he became great and then all of a sudden one day he just woke up and said what am I doing here and then he went to the temple of the Lord he began to burn incense against the will of the Lord and against everything the Lord has said in his word and then the priest came unto him they said Uzziah you are a king. 
it appertains not unto you to burn incense before the Lord. Get out because this is not going to be to advantage your profit. And then he got angry. He was wroth. And leprosy came from the altar and came upon him. Uzziah, this is a preventable tragedy. And as I'm telling you today, that many things that happen, and people will say, God wanted it to happen like that. The will of the Lord be done. No, it's not the will of the Lord. It's a preventable tragedy. Miriam. Now, Miriam was, you know, was such a wonderful sister of Moses. You remember the story? Even when Moses was born, was she not the was she not the one that made Moses to be taken care of by the mother? And eventually, Moses got married. And after Moses got married, God was all right with the marriage. And God was using Moses even with the marriage. Everything was all right in the sight of the Lord. And now Miriam and Aaron began to say, uh -huh, what kind of marriage is this? And what kind of woman is this? And leprosy came upon Miriam. And we're saying, a wonderful woman like Miriam. A protector like Miriam and someone that even led all the women in the singing when it came out of the Red Sea. That's not a woman that should have leprosy, but the tragedy of leprosy came upon her because of her carelessness. Preventable tragedy. But as we look at other people that you know tragedy should have happened, think about, for example, Nineveh. Here comes Jonah, and Jonah said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. You know, if the king of Nineveh had been a member of the church that says, Whatever will be, will be, God said, It's all over. God said, We're going to be destroyed. There's nothing. This is tragedy, and it is already confirmed by the prophet. In fact, the prophet passed through the sea and the land to come and tell us, Forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. He would have said, That's all right. Just throw our hands up. There's nothing we can do. But the king said, we can prevent this. We can avoid this. We can turn this around. Preventable tragedy. Here comes the prophet of God unto Isaiah. And Isaiah said, Ezekiah, set your house in order because you are going to die. You know, if Ezekiah belonged to that other church that says whatever will be, will be predestination, he has already ordained, I'm going to die at this time. Ezekiel would have said, that's all right. The prophet is saying it. This is the prophet that prophesied about unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. The government shall be on his shoulder. This is the prophet that spoke about Christ. And the prophet came and said, Ezekiel, you will die. But Ezekiel said, preventable tragedy. This one, we will prevent this one. I'm telling you this morning, all these tragedies that people are going through, and they say it's final, that we can do nothing. This time, we're going to change every negative thing. Yeah. Tragedies are preventable. Don't you ever see that it's forever set to predestination. You're going to make a choice, and your choice will make your life better in Jesus' name. Yeah. That's the reason I come to you today, wanting to look at the word of God and wanting you to understand that there is no tragedy that is so fixed, no tragedy that is so permanent, no tragedy that is so preordained or predestined that you cannot change. Everything negative will change in your life in Jesus' name. And so Ezekiah began to pray. Ezekiah said, Lord, how will this happen? You tell me to set my house in order and I'm going to die. I'm not ready. I still have a lot of things to do. And then God said, Isaiah, go back to that man. He's not ready to die yet. He's sin. I'm going to spend eternity in heaven when I get there. What's the hurry? What's the hurry? I'm not going now. And the Lord said, I give you how many years more? 15 years more. That man knew that you could change all those preventable tragedies. Divine antidote. What's the antidote? What's the solution? How do you change something negative? A preventable tragedy. Number one, by faith. Let's look at it now. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 16. Above all, taking the shield of faith 
wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the furry darts of the wicked. Don't you ever tell yourself, don't you ever think that all those uh, kind of maneuvering and mot motivation of the enemy, all the things that the devil will do to monitor your life and then to maneuver and then to be able to do something that is wrong and destroy you, that, well, what can I do? What can I do? He is Satan. He has made up his mind. He's going to destroy me. All the fairy darts of the wicked were going to destroy by faith in Jesus' name. Hebrews, I'm reading from chapter 6, verse 12. All the tragedies of life that maybe you have been living with and saying, I accept, well, what can I do? You will do something about them today. In Hebrews chapter 6, verse 12, that she be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit promises. There's faith and then there is patience. Through faith and patience, we inherit the promises job chapter 22 here we're looking at verse 27 and verse 28 thou shalt make thy prayer unto him and he shall hear thee i thought you'll say amen. amen you know by prayer you can change all those preventable tragedies you'll make your prayer unto the lord and the lord will hear thee and thou shalt pay thy vows look at verse 28 thou shalt also tell me decree a thing when you see a tragedy when you see something evil and it's coming it's coming it's coming and then you just stay there and then you open your chest and say come why do you do that why don't you say i reject that that will not be this tragedy will not be mine. Death will not be mine. Destruction will not be mine. Calamity will not be mine. I decree that my present life, which is not all right, it will be torn, and I'm going to have the best for the, from the kingdom and the king of kings in Jesus' name. It will be so in Jesus' name. Thou shalt also decree a thing, and it shall be established unto thee. And the light shall shine upon thy ways. There is faith, there's patience, there's obedience to the word of God, and preventable tragedies are going to be turned around in our lives in Jesus' name. I just want to show you three areas where we need to think about what brings tragedies into the lives of people. And how we need to prevent all those tragedies. Number one is a tragedy of impatience. Number two, the transgression of indifference. What can I do? What if the king of Nineveh had said, is God? He says that's what he wants to do. And he has sent his prophet all the way from Israel. And the man passed through the whale to even get in here. That's what God says he wants to do. Let him do it. No, he didn't say that. But you know, the people are indifferent. They're just like that. Their hands are down. Their minds are down. They cannot stand upon the promises of God. Those things are preventable. We're going to prevent them. I said we're going to prevent them. Number three is the tongue of iniquity. Let's go to number one. Number one, preventing the tragedy of impatience. In 1 Samuel chapter 13, I'm looking at it from verse 8. And it tarried seven days according to the set time that Samuel had appointed. But Samuel came not to Gilgal, and the people were scattered from him. And so said, Bring hither a burnt offering to me, and peace offerings. And he offered the burnt offering. And it came to pass that as soon as he had made an end of offering the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came. Can you imagine somebody who had waited for seven days? And just at the end of the seven days, because Samuel had not showed up, he then went to do something he shouldn't have done. And as soon as he finished, just a few minutes after he had, after he had done what he did, then Samuel came. And then we're told in the next verse after Samuel came, that Samuel asked him. Then we're told in verse 10, Behold, Samuel came, and Saul went out to meet him, that he might salute him. And Samuel said, 
what hast thou done? Impatience. He could have waited just a few minutes more, even an hour, even two hours, even five hours, even 12 hours. You have waited all these seven days without saying anything negative, doing anything negative, just waiting for the prophet Samuel. And then because he saw the people, he now did what he did. What have you done? And Saul said, because I saw that the people were scattered from me, and that thou camest not within the days appointed, and that the Philistines gathered themselves together at Michmash. Therefore said I, the Philistines will come down now upon me to Gilgal, and I have not made supplication unto the Lord. I forced myself therefore. I knew my conscience was telling me this is not right. I forced myself, therefore, it was the first time I'll do something. I never did something like this in my life. I knew that this is not my place, my position. I didn't have any authority, I didn't have any permission from the Lord to do it. But what could I do? I forced myself and offered a burnt offering. And Samuel said unto Saul, Thou hast done foolishly. Thou hast not kept the commandment of the Lord thy God, which he commanded thee. For now would the Lord have established your kingdom upon Israel forever. Look at that. Now the Lord would have established your kingdom forever. From you to your children and to their children to their children, the Lord would have established your kingdom forever. What tragedy came upon it, but now thy kingdom shall not continue but now that kingdom shall not continue it was a tragedy that was preventable just wait a little just be patient and don't take loss into your hand preventable tragedy Hebrews chapter 12 verse 14 follow peace with all men the different kinds of men there are some men that will try to take your right away from you follow peace with all men there are some men that they just walk through life and push down everybody they want to push down so they can get to where they're getting to follow peace with all men god is your protector god is your provider god is your defender don't have any issue with anybody don't join battle with anybody follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the lord What's your purpose in life? What's your purpose and your goal for eternity? To see the Lord. Well, to see the Lord is more important than getting money. To see the Lord is more important than being popular. To see the Lord is more important than any other thing we're seeking for on earth. And if that is your priority, you let other things go so you can be at peace with men and follow holiness so that you'll see the Lord. Then he tells us what we're to remember. And he tells us about a man of impatience. That because he wasn't patient, he lost everything. A tragedy of impatience. In verse 15, looking diligently. Lest any man fail of the grace of God. Lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you. Any root of bitterness. You know when we're bitter, we think we're going to hurt the people we're bitter about. But no, it hurts us. Any root of bitterness in us. You know, we came to the church, and when you came to the church, all you wanted to do was just get saved and say this word. I never had anything like this before. You cherished the word. You appreciated the word. You received the word. The first time we called you to do this, you said, me, can I do that? Me, am I qualified to do that? I didn't come to do anything. I didn't come to do anything. All I came to do, just this word of God, bread of life, give it unto me. That's what, that's what your, your attitude. But now, after some years, we forgot ourselves. A little happening here, we become bitter. A little interaction here, we become bitter. A little denial, we become bitter. And then that bitterness make a, a root to spring up within us. And then it says it troubles you and thereby many be defiled. We shall save people, we shall help people, cleanse people. We defile them by our attitude because we are bitter. And then it says, lest there be any fornicator or profane person 
as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. The tragedy of impatience is verse 17. For ye know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he would have inherited the blessing. That's what the word of God says he would have. But he lost it. It was a tragedy that was preventable then, he said. When he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. The crying could not do it. He should have prevented that at the right time. The Lord is telling us we should be very careful, take it because of impatience. Proverbs chapter 28, verse 22. He that hastes to be rich, impatience. He that hastes to be rich has an evil eye and considereth not that poverty shall come upon him preventable poverty we could have prevented that preventable tragedy you could have prevented that but because of the haste because of the hurry because of the impatience to get this and get that then people ruin their lives first timothy chapter 6 verse 9 but they that will be rich that is they who say by force, by crook, by lying, by craft, by deception. Come what me, I must get it. And they become so impatient, push everybody ahead of them down. And push everybody around them down. Destroy themselves and their families. Forget their children, forget everyone. And they're seeking to have this or that. It says, they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, into many foolish actions, many lusts. And it says, many snares, hurtful lusts, which draw men in destruction and perdition for the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith. The faith that saves and the faith that prepares us for heaven and the faith that makes us ready for the coming of the Lord. They err, they go astray from the faith. And then it says, and they pierce themselves through with many sorrows. The tragedy of impatience in a hurry to be rich. And the Lord is saying the divine antidote and the divine solution is that we become patient. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 36. For ye have need of patience. I've repented. I've done what I need to do. I've sought the face of the Lord. I've returned to the Lord. I've told the Lord, I'm sorry for whatever it is in the past. I'm not ready to walk in the way of righteousness. After that, ye have need of patience. You know, there are people who say, now I've done the right thing and everything is okay. And I've cleansed my way. I've repented. I've made restitution. And I believe I'm okay with God now. Give me this now. Give me this now. After all, what you are talking about, that that was not right. Everything is right now. What's the matter with you? You have need of patience. They're going to get into another problem. They're going to get into another kind of evil strategy for evil you're going to get into another uh, you know kind of uh, thing that is not according to the will of god it says and ye have need of patience that after ye have done the will of god ye might receive the promise no hurry no impatience no pushing everybody down no uh, no kind of creation of another evil again and I think that is not right. I realize my way. I realize this, and then we put some things together again. You have need of patience. That after you've done the will of God, you'll inherit the blessing. Hebrews chapter twelve. 
Verse 1. Here the word of God is reminding us where for seeing who also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily beset us. And let us run with patience. After you have laid aside the sin, laid aside the evil, you have repented and your natural tendency everything something happens you don't lie there's a natural tendency the sin that does so easily beset us but you bleed us aside now all right that's good but remember tragedy of impatience let us now run with patience the race that is set before us james chapter one we're looking at verses three and four knowing this that the trying of your faith walketh patience. You know, sometimes you believe the Lord. I'm asking for this. I'm asking for that. I'm demanding this. I'm decreeing this. And I say, little delay. Don't take loss into your hand. Just because of that little delay. It says, let patience have a perfect work. Look at verse 4. But let patience have a perfect work that she may be perfect and entire lacking nothing wanting nothing james chapter 5 reading from verse 7 be patient therefore brethren unto the coming of the lord many things happen temptations are there trials are there persecution is there there are things you find inconvenient and when you find those things inconvenient in your life uncomfortable for you and the lord is saying stay there stand there don't argue don't fight don't say well because i put this in place i put that in place i put that in place then i ought to have this now be patient therefore you know, sometimes it's the prophecy that the Lord has given you, the dream, the vision the Lord has given you. I'm going to be this, I'm going to be that. That reminds us of the mother of Jacob, Jacob and Esau, Esau and Jacob. When she was pregnant, the Lord had told her that the younger will rule over the older, and the older will serve the younger. And now I see called Esau and he said go and make me the kind of food I like venison and then come and give it to me and then she had that and she called Jacob and said very quickly hear my word go and do the kind of food venison that your father loves and give it to him so that he can bless you and Jacob said what if my father detects that I came to deceive him uh -uh. I have the word from the Lord. And because this is what you have to do, listen to me. What a tragedy he brought upon herself. She brought upon herself and upon Jacob the son and even upon Esau. Because there's a long time battle between them. And you're going to find even after Esau died, after Jacob died, the enmity between Israel and Edom. Israel coming from Jacob, Edom coming from Esau. That enmity continued. Many were defiled and destroyed because of the situation between Jacob and Esau. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husband man waited for the precious fruit of the earth and has long patience for it until he received the early and the latter rain. Be ye also patient. Running and running. Be in a hurry. I want it now. I want it. I must get it now. This is my life. If it passes now, when it will come back again. Be ye also patient. Establish your hearts. For the coming of the Lord draws nigh. The Lord is telling us we need patience to be able to perfect the fruit of righteousness in our lives. Luke chapter 8 verse 15. Impatience. Looks like people are passing impatience to their children. Friends are passing impatience to their friends. And even leaders sometimes are passing impatience to the members of the church. Hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. Finishing time. Impatience. 
And the Lord is saying that impatience can bring tragedy into our lives. Preventable tragedy. Prevent it. Avoid it. Luke chapter 8, verse 15. But that on the good ground are they which in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it and bring forth fruit with patience. Bringing forth fruit with patience. Number one, preventing the tragedy of impatience. Number two, prevailing over the transgression of indifference. This is another thing that brings tragedy in people's lives. Preventable tragedies. Something that could easily be avoided. Prevented. They do not prevent it because of indifference. Well, that means I don't care. They're carefree. I'm not concerned. If it comes okay, if it doesn't come all right, if I'm allowed okay, if I'm not allowed okay, if I have it all right, if I don't have it all right, indifference that they do not care. And the Lord is saying that is going to bring a tragedy we could have prevented. Exodus chapter 9, verse 18. Behold, tomorrow about this time, I will cause it to rain a very grievous hail, such as has not been in Egypt since the foundations thereof, even until now. Send therefore now and gather thy cattle and all that thou hast in the field. For upon every man and beast which shall be found in the field, and shall not be brought home, the hail shall come down upon them, and they shall, what? Die. They were warned. Hail, judgment of hail coming. He that feared the Lord, the word of the Lord among the servants of Pharaoh, made his servants and his cattle to flee into the houses. And he that regarded not the word of the Lord, let his servants and his cattle in the field. Those who did not care. What do I care about, about hail coming? About judgment coming? They didn't care. Verse 22. And the Lord said unto Moses, Stretch forth thy hand toward heaven, that there may be hail in all the land of Egypt, upon man, upon beast, and upon the herb, upon herb of the field, throughout the land of Egypt. And Moses stretched forth his hand toward heaven, and the Lord sent thunder and hail, and the fire ran along upon the ground, and the Lord rained hail upon the land of Egypt. So there was hail and fire mingled with the hail. And then it says, very grievous, such as there was not, there was none like it in all the land of Egypt, since it became a nation. And the hail smote throughout all the land of Egypt, all that was in the field, both man and beast. And the hail smote every herb of the field and break every tree of the field. There were careless, carefree men that remained in the field. They didn't care. They didn't worry. Judgment was coming. Hail will be coming. Who cares? They said. And because of that, they died unnecessarily and went to hell prematurely. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 24. Because I have called and he refused, I have stretched out my hand and no man regarded. But he have said at not all my counsel, and would not, and would none of my reproof. I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear cometh. Those are indifferent people. God wants them. They don't care. God speaks. They don't care. They don't bother. And He says because of that indifference, because I stretch out my hand, and you refuse. Because I warned you, and you refuse. I'm going to laugh when your calamity comes. Verse 27, when your fear cometh as desolation, and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind, when distress and anguish cometh upon you, then 
shall they call upon me but i will not answer they shall seek me early but they shall not find me for that they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the lord they would none of my counsel they despised all my reproof therefore shall they eat of the fruit of their own way and be filled with their own devices for the turning away of the simple shall slay them and the prosperity of fools shall destroy them is telling us there that we need to care when god says that this is what to do we do each very quickly and we do it exactly as he wants it done malachi chapter 2 verse 2 if he will not hear if he will not lay it to heart if you'll say i don't care i'm not worried i'm not concerned what are you thinking about what are you thinking that's so serious a matter i don't think like that i'm indifferent i just want whatever will happen to happen the lord is saying if you will not hear the word of the lord the word of wisdom and the word of warning and the word that shows the way of the lord how to live what to do how to return unto the lord if ye will not hear and then it says if ye will not take it to heart lay it to heart it will just say i just want to free my mind from that i don't want to be thinking about you know repent turn to the lord be righteous come to the lord make right your way obey the lord i just want to i want to be free i just want to remove everything away from my heart i'm not i'm not storing that thing in my mind being indifferent as to what the lord requires for salvation as to what the lord requires for getting to heaven and having relationship and fellowship with him it says if you're not late to to give glory unto me unto my name says the lord of hosts i will even send a curse upon you it's a preventable curse a preventable calamity that shouldn't have been but he said, if you will not lay to hand, that's what I'm going to do. I will curse your blessings. And then he said, yea, I have cursed them already. Because you do not lay it to heart. It's the transgression of indifference that the Lord is saying that should not be. Don't be indifferent. We're looking at Judges chapter 5 verse 23. It says, curse ye mirrors saith says the angel of the lord cause he bitterly the inhabitants thereof why what he will have they committed adultery fornication immorality stealing sacred sacrilege what is it they have done because they came not to the help of the lord to the help of the lord against the mighty it says just because they were carefree careless non-challenge not caring not bothered not concerned and because they came not to the help of the lord and he said well that's all right gideon is there gideon is doing it and he said they are there deborah is doing it and they said barak is doing and all those people are there what do i need to worry the 300 people following after gideon they're all there and those apostles are there those disciples are there all the soul winners are there what have i got to do I'm all right since everybody is there already what can i add to what they're doing that indifference brings calamity and brings tragedy i pray god will save us from all that tragedy in jesus name yeah. revelation chapter 3 verse 14 and unto the angel of the church of the laudicians write this saying says the amen the faithful and the true witness the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou art cold or hot. Indifferent, neither cold nor hot. Indifferent, neither up nor down. Indifferent, neither for or against. Indifferent, neither fervent nor just not doing anything. Or just like that, neither cold nor hot. It says so then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, 
I will spew thee out of my mouth. Where do you stand? On which side are you? All these that were talking about the salvation of sinners and the evangelization of our community. Where do you stand? I stand nowhere. It's all right. Let them go and do it. I'm not opposed to it. Only I don't know why. I just don't have any interest to do anything different. I just want to be at peace and at ease. I just want to live my life a quiet life. Get something done. No, it's too late for me now. I don't know the way my heart is. It's like I'm not interested in anything anymore. And the Lord is saying, because you are neither cold nor hot, I will spill thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich. What else am I looking for? I'm increased with goods. What else am I searching for? And I've need of nothing. What do I need again? I've done enough. I've got enough. I possess enough. Because of that, you're indifferent to the call of the Lord. And then it says, And knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed. And that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. The people that are indifferent, they're naked spiritually. And because they say, I don't care, it's not my concern. I'm not asking for anything. I'm all right the way I am. I don't have to do anything anymore. That coldness, that lukewarmness, it says that makes you naked. And then it says, anoint thine eyes with eyes serve, that thou may see. As many as I love, I reveal. As many as I, what? I hate. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasing. Be zealous, therefore, and do what? And repent. Don't be indifferent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. The Lord wants us to be active, to get up and get something done. And not to be indifferent, prevailing over the transgression of indifference. Point number three now, we need to deal with the tongue of iniquity. The tongue of iniquity. Isn't that the tongue that brought tragedy, preventable tragedy, upon many, many people? We're looking at James chapter 3, preventable tragedy. The tragedy of an untamed tongue, uncontrolled tongue, unguarded tongue, unguided tongue. James chapter 3, verse 6. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body, and setteth on fire the curse of nature. And it is set on the fire of hell. How many people claim to be saved and their tongues bring them to the tragedy of hellfire? How many people claim to be trusted, trustworthy members of the church and their tongues get them into destruction, devastation? The tongue is a world of iniquity, brings destruction upon people. We're looking at 2 Kings chapter 7. Then Elisha said, Hear the word of the Lord. That shall silence everybody. There is somebody there whose tongue will not be at rest. When you hear, hear the word of the Lord. That should make everybody pay attention and not think about your own thoughts, your own feeling, your own imagination, your own mind. Hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord. Tomorrow, about this time, shall a measure of flour of fine flour be sold for a shekel, and two measures of barley for a shekel in the gate of Samaria. Then a lord on whose hand the king leaned answered the man of God and said, Behold, if the Lord would open the windows of heaven, my this thing be you don't have to say that 
If you didn't believe, you could have kept quiet. You can, let, just, you can just say to yourself, let's wait and see. Look at what the prophet is saying. And look at what the prophet is declaring in his prophecy, prediction. By this time tomorrow, the famine will come to an end. Everything will change. And God will be plenty and prosperity for his people once again. And then he said, even if the Lord will open the windows of heaven, how can that be? You, could, you shouldn't have said that. The tongue of iniquity, iniquity in their tongue, sin in their tongue, unbelief in their tongue. And when it comes like that, when you speak it out like that, you make other people to be unbelieving. He was a Lord on whom the king was leaning. And when a person like that says anything doubtful, anything unbelieving, anything derogatory to the word of God, other people too will be unbelieving. And then the man of God said, and he said, Behold, thou shalt see it with thine eyes, but shall not eat thereof. Let's look at verse 16. In verse 16, and the people went out and they spoiled the tents of the Syrians. So a measure of fine flour was sold for a shekel, and two measures of barley for a shekel, according to the word of the Lord. And the king appointed the Lord on whose hand he leaned to have the charge of the gate. And the people trudged upon him in the gate, and he died as the man of God had said, who speak when the king came down to him. See the tragedy that came on him because of his tongue. That shouldn't have happened. Why would you allow such things to happen in your life? We're looking at Numbers chapter 14, preventable tragedy. It's good to be quiet, good to be silent. Even when you don't understand what's going on, why this, why that, why you're not quiet, why don't you, don't you just keep quiet and say, let's see what will happen. If it concerns you, you go to the Lord in prayer. You repent, turn to the Lord. And after that repentance, after you've done the will of God, you remain patient. Rather than spoiling everything, spoiling your case, spoiling your life with the utterances of your tongue. We're looking at Numbers chapter 14, verse 28. 14, verse 28. Here the Lord is telling us about those ten spies that went to the land and they came back. And then also, these uh, children of Israel that murmured, that cried, that felt, Why has God brought us out of the land of Egypt to die in this wilderness? See what happened. Verse 28. Numbers 14, say unto them, as truly as I live, says the Lord, as ye have spoken in mine ears, so will I do unto you. Your carcasses shall fall in this wilderness, and all that were numbered of you according to your whole number from twenty years old and upward, which have murmured against me, doubtless ye shall not come into the land concerning which I swear to make you dwell therein, except Caleb the son of Jephunneh and Joshua the son of Nun. But your little ones, which ye said should be a prey, them will I bring in, and they shall know the land which ye have despised. But as for you and your carcasses, they shall fall in this wilderness. Your children shall wander in the wilderness forty years and bear your wardoms, and until your carcasses be wasted in the in the wilderness, after the number of the days in which he searched the land, even forty days each day day for a year shall ye bear your iniquities even forty years and ye shall know the breach of my promise see what the lord did to them because of their tongue because of what he said the tongue of iniquity and do you remember the word of god i am god i change not I'm sure you are not thinking that God is wiser today than he was before. He's always wise. 
And what you did before you all, it still does. You might not see it because it's not happening to this nation at the same time, but it's still happening. Many people are losing their spiritual heritage and spiritual life, and they're dying spiritually. Others are dying in other ways because of the misuse of their tongue. Verse 35, I, the Lord, have said it. I will surely do it unto all the, this evil congregation that are gathered together against me in this wilderness. They shall be consumed, and they and their they shall die. And the men which Moses sent to search the land, who, who returned and made all the congregation to murmur against him by bringing up a slander upon the land. Leaders are supposed to lead people into righteousness. Leaders are supposed to lead people into faith, into obedience, into humility. But these leaders that went to the land to search them out, when they came back, instead of leading people to faith, and leading people to obedience, and leading people to righteousness by their slander, they led people to backsliding, to murmuring, to grumbling, to complaining, and to disobedience and unfaithfulness against the Lord. And the Lord said, even those men, verse 37, that did bring up an evil report upon the land, they died by the plague before the Lord. But Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephone, which were all of the men, that went to search the land lived still. The Lord is telling us then that we need to watch our tongue. Luke chapter 1. In Luke chapter 1, here we see again the necessity of repenting from the iniquity of the tongue, unbridled tongue, uncontrolled tongue, unguarded tongue, unguided tongue. We're looking at Luke chapter 1, verse 11. In verse 11, there appeared unto him an angel of the Lord, standing on the right hand side of the altar of incense. And when Zechariah saw him, he was troubled, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zechariah, for thy prayer is heard. And thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. And thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth. The angel came with good news that shall bring joy. The angel came with good news that shall bring gladness. And a thing that ought to bring joy and gladness. And this is not the first time Zacharias, don't you remember the case of Abraham and Sarah? Don't you remember the case of Anna? Don't you remember the case of Isaac and the wife? The Lord gave them children and the mother and the father of Samson. It had happened before. And the angel now came and said, this is going to happen. And he said, you are going to have a son in your old age. His name is going to be John. In verse 15, it says, For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink, and he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost, even from even, he says, from his mother's womb. And many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God. Everything is good news concerning the child to come. And then it says in verse 17, It shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just and to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Here comes now the preventable tragedy of the tongue. Here comes now avoidable tragedy. The tragedy of the iniquity of the tongue. This shouldn't have been. And the same thing I'm trying to tell you, when good news comes to you, and the Lord is saying, this is what is going to happen. I'm about to do this. I'm about to do this. We're planting churches. There's going to be a mighty revival. Many people are going to turn to the Lord. And the Lord is going to use you and use us and use this and use that. Keep quiet if you don't understand. Instead of opening your mouth and saying, how can this be and why should this be? And why is this and why is that? Avoid the tragedy. 
that comes upon the people that say what they don't understand. And when this angel came to Zacharias, then he opened his mouth. Look at verse 18 now. And Zacharias said unto the angel, Whereby shall I know this? He didn't have to say that. And he was a man of God, a priest of God. He should have understood what God did for all the people. In days gone by, and that God says, I am God, is there anything too hard for me? No, there's nothing too hard for him. And so he said, for I am an old man, and my wife well stricken in years. And the angel answering said unto him, I am Gabriel, that stand in the presence of God. I am, and I'm sent to speak unto thee and to show thee these glad tidings, good news, that then brought some calamity upon him, tragedy upon him. And behold, thou shalt be dumb and not able to speak until the day that these things shall be performed, because thou believest not my words, which shall be fulfilled in his season. They were told in verse 21, and the people waited for Zacharias and marveled that he tarried so long in the temple. And when he came out, he could not speak unto them. And they perceived that he had seen a vision in the temple, for he, be he beckoned unto them and remained speechless. That's the reason. The reason is because he made use of his tongue in a wrong way. The Lord is telling us that we need to keep this tongue. Proverbs chapter two, chapter seventeen verse twenty. Proverbs chapter seventeen. We're looking at verse twenty. The Lord is telling us bring that tongue under control. Guard that tongue. Protect that tongue. Let there be a bridle that is guarding, controlling the tongue. Proverbs chapter 17, verse 20. He that has a forward heart findeth no good, and he that has a perverse tongue falleth into mischief. He that has a perverse tongue falleth into mischief. Chapter 18, verse 21. In chapter 18, verse 21, death and life are in the power of the tongue. And they that use it, they that love it, shall eat the fruit thereof. The Lord is telling us then, control that tongue, keep that tongue, watch over that tongue, so it doesn't become your ruin, your destruction. We're looking at First Peter chapter 3. First Peter chapter 3. I'm reading from verse 9. First Peter chapter 3 verse 9. Not rendering evil for evil. Or railing for railing, but contrary wise blessing, knowing that ye are thereunto called that ye should inherit a blessing. The Lord wants us to inherit blessing. He doesn't want you to lose your blessing or forfeit your blessing, but your tongue has to be under control. For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil. And his lips that they speak no guile, no deception. Let him eschew evil, shun evil, and do good. Let him seek peace and eschew it, ensure it. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. James chapter 1. In James chapter 1, verse 26, If any man among you seem to be religious, and bridleth not his tongue, controlleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. He's saying, whatever else we do, whatever qualities we think we have, whatever skill or ability we have, whatever spirituality we think we have, if a man does not guard, keep, control, bridle his tongue, this person's religion is vain. Chapter 3, James chapter 3, verse 1. Brethren, be not many masters, 
knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation for many things will offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man, able also to bridle, to control, to guard, to keep his whole body. Psalm 39. In Psalm 39, the psalmist is making a decision that you ought to make, that you are not going to allow the avoidable, preventable tragedy that comes as a result of the wrong use of the tongue. You're not going to allow that to come upon your life. The Lord will keep us in Jesus' name. Guard your tongue. Guard your tongue. Especially when you're with a friend. Guard your tongue. Especially when the enemy is before you. Mind what you say. Especially when conditions around you are not uh, comfortable. When it appears that is, you know, some things are happening. Guard your tongues. And when you're with family members, guard your tongue. When Aaron and Miriam are discussing together, guard your tongue. When Michael, the wife of David, when you see him doing some, why should he do that? Why is he rejoicing like that and throwing this and throwing that? As if he's one of the common people among the people. You know, guard your tongue at such a time and control your mind, your spirit, and control your personality and your tongue. In Psalm 39, I'm reading from verse 1, I said, I will take heed to my ways that I sin not with my tongue. I will take heed unto my ways that I sin not with my tongue. I will keep my mouth with a bridle while the wicked is before me. The Lord wants us to keep the tongue so we don't fall into the tragedy of the people that are careless with their tongue. And I pray that this control, the Lord, will help us to keep on our tongue in Jesus' name. So that we'll not fall into the error, we'll not fall into the situation of all the other people. Psalm 141, Psalm 141. I'm looking at verse 3. Psalm 141, verse 3. Set a watch, O Lord, before my mouth. Set a watch, O Lord, before my mouth. Keep the door of my lips. That's the prayer we ought to pray. Remember, not just the tongue, there's impatience, the tragedy of impatience. Not only that, there is the transgression of indifference. I don't care. I'm not concerned. I'm not worried. I'm not bothered. The transgression of indifference and now the iniquity of the tongue. And the Lord is telling us, guard yourself, control yourself, seek the face of the Lord, that the Lord himself will put you under control and these tragedies will be prevented. They will not come upon your life in Jesus' name. He has given us the divine antidote for preventable tragedy. We're going to take, we're going to make use of that antidote, the face and the patience and then the obedience to the word of the Lord and then our lives be secured and preserved in Jesus' name. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer and say, Lord, help us. Lord, help us. All this tragedy is that will be prevented. Help us, Lord, and it will be done. Don't be a careless and carefree so-called Christian. Your tongue can destroy all the Christian experiences you profess. Salvation, your tongue can nullify that. Holiness, sanctification, righteousness, consecration, devotion, your tongue and destroy everything you profess. The Lord is saying, tragedies are preventable. Calamities are preventable. Sudden destruction is preventable. Suffering in the family is preventable. Falling from grace to grass is preventable. I search before you life and death. Just life. Death is preventable. Premature death. Destruction is preventable. Defeat is preventable. Failure is preventable. 
Remember the tragedy of impatience, the transgression of indifference, the tongue of iniquity. They all bring tragedies that can be prevented. Take the divine precaution, divine exhortation, divine.